I worship you, Jesus. I love you, God. I worship you, Jesus. Amen. They're going to drop the screen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, for bringing us into the Lord's presence tonight. Uh, I hope you love Christmas. If you don't, you're probably already turning into the Grinch because we kind of started early this year. Um, a lot of times we only end up singing Christmas carols uh, for a week. And so we just decided we'd kind of celebrate a little bit through the month of December. Today is... Um, actually kind of a unique day. It's a very special anniversary. Um, 50 years ago tonight on December the 9th, uh, 1965, uh, a Charlie Brown Christmas aired for the very first time. It's become kind of a seasonal um, uh, annual tradition for many, many people. And uh, Charles Schultz, most of us are familiar with his comic strip, uh, Peanuts, but we're, we're, we're not all uh, familiar with um, uh, kind of the man himself, I guess. And he was quite a, a unique individual. Uh, I, I'm a Charlie Brown fan, and if that offends you, I apologize. But I really think Charlie Brown is awesome, probably because I identify with him a little bit. Um, and we are uh, kind of educating down through the generations of our family uh, to love Charlie Brown. We've already kind of started the indoctrination, and that's, uh, that's wonderful. And uh, we're having fun with it. But it was 50 years ago uh, tonight that uh, that started. And so we're going to take about uh, a couple minutes here, and we're just going to set the tone for the first little part and uh, just enjoy. I think this is uh, probably... Something you'll remember. something wrong with me, Linus. Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. I just don't understand Christmas, I guess. I like getting presents and sending Christmas cards and decorating trees and all that, but I'm still not happy. I always end up feeling depressed. Charlie Brown, you're the only person I know who can take a wonderful season like Christmas and turn it into a problem. Maybe Lucy's right. Of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. Charlie Brown Christmas. Charles Schultz was quite an incredible individual, the cartoonist that drew Charlie Brown for many, many years. Uh, the Peanuts comic strip is 65 years old this year, and Charlie Brown Christmas, the animated special, is uh, 50 years old today, actually. I, I was checking into a hotel in Louisville, Kentucky, a week ago Monday, and uh, on the front page of USA Today, it said, good grief, Charlie Brown, Christmas turns 50. And I, I, I pulled open the uh, life section and it had a big article, uh, Charlie Brown Christmas for 50 years and counting. Um, but it was called in the article, a special that almost wasn't. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a neat story. Uh, a Charlie Brown Christmas was born at Schultz's home out in California. Um, 
he and a director got together and they mapped out this 25 minute feature in just a couple of hours. Uh, he says the ideas just kind of flew out of our head and we, we wrote it down. Um, and, and so they, they put this together and after they submitted the show's outline back to the producers, they gave them only five months to animate this whole thing and, and uh, compose the music and, and all of that. And as they were working on it, the uh, Hollywood people kept coming in and saying, this is not going to work. This is too slow. This is too religious. This is, this is, is not good. You've got a kid's choir singing and you've got children doing the voices. Then this is not going to work. And um, Schultz insisted that it was going to work, and the rest is history. He's quite a guy. He, he drew the, the peanut strip, and um, I, I always appreciated uh, the family kind of uh, values in that strip and also uh, the overt religious references. Now, of course, you know his main character is Charlie Brown, and Charlie Brown has a dog named Snoopy, and, and uh, then all the other friends that Charlie Brown has. Um, Schultz once said that if you know Charlie Brown, you know me, because he's kind of one of those just ordinary people. Uh, he, he's just kind of every man. He has lots of problems. He has lots of difficulties, and he has friends that alternate between being really, really nice to him, and sometimes they're a little critical of him, and sometimes they have issues and problems, and so that was Schultz's world. Um, he, he actually started Charlie Brown um, with a, a, a strip, it looked a little different. This is the first Charlie Brown comic strip ever uh, back in October 1950. Uh, and there's just two kids sitting on the sidewalk. Charlie Brown looks similar, but not quite the same. Uh, well, here comes old Charlie Brown. Good old Charlie Brown, yes, sir. Good old Charlie Brown. How I hate him. <laughs> it's kind of like gossip sitting in the corner of the church foyer as somebody goes by. You know, it's just Charlie Brown, it's just ordinary life. Now, now, this is a cool story. This is the very last Charlie Brown comic strip that was ever released. This is the last one. It was released on February the 13th, 2000. And, and it's kind of a, a neat piece of history. Um, you, you see uh, Charlie Brown answering the phone. No, I think he's writing. And then it's Snoopy on his doghouse with his typewriter. And he's typing, Dear Friends. And then down below is a letter, an actual letter from Charles Schultz that he had written because he was suffering with cancer and he wasn't going to be able to continue uh, doing the strips. He did every comic strip all of the years he drew Charlie Brown, uh, all of them by himself. And his family didn't want anybody else to do it, so he was retiring. It was a big blow to the comic strip world and the newspapers. And here's his letter. Dear friends, I've been fortunate to draw Charlie Brown and his friends for almost 50 years. It's been the fulfillment of my childhood ambition. Unfortunately, I'm no longer able to maintain the schedule demanded by a daily comic strip. My family does not wish Peanuts to be continued by anyone else. Therefore, I'm announcing my retirement. I have been grateful over the years for the loyalty of our editors, the wonderful support and love expressed to me by fans of the comic strip. Charlie Brown, Snoopy, Linus, Lucy. How can I ever forget them? Charles M. Schultz. The interesting thing about that piece of history is that Comic strips are produced weeks, sometimes months in advance, depending on the syndication. And Schultz died the night before that ran in the newspaper. And uh, so that's kind of a, a little piece of history that his fans always remembered about him. Here's Schultz explaining about the special. I can remember talking to Bill Melendez and Lee Mendelson, and I think the key to it was that we sat there trying to put together this show, and I said, you know, the more we think about it, we cannot do this show without including the famous passage from St. Luke. And that had never been done before either. No one would ever put biblical passages in an animated show. And we did it, and of course, when Linus walks out onto the stage and says, lights please, and there were, and there were shepherds, you know, in the field. That was the highlight of the show. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, 
a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. That's what Christmas is all about. Schultz said in that video, that's the only copy I could find of that particular interview. He said, Linus reading from Luke chapter 2, despite all the negativity and despite all the opposition from the network people and from the Hollywood people and from the publicity people, he later said Linus reading from Luke chapter 2 was literally the highlight of a Charlie Brown Christmas. Quite a, a unique man. And uh, he made quite a contribution. Now, we're not here to talk about Charlie Brown. We're here to talk about the second of three wise women that play in the Christmas story. But I think you'll see the connection in just a little bit. There's no Bible record, by the way, of what we call the three wise men. We sing songs that we don't have any Bible for, like we three kings of Orient are. There are no uh, references to three kings. Uh, we, we don't know if it was three or we know it's more than one because it's plural, uh, the wise men. But we don't know how many. It could have been 100. It could have been 50. We don't know. But we do know that these three women, they have very important roles in the Christmas story. Last week, we met a wise woman named Elizabeth. And what's unique about her is that her story actually takes place before the Christmas account of Luke 2. And tonight we're going to meet a lady, a wise elderly woman named Anna, and her story actually takes place several days after the birth of Jesus that's recounted in Luke chapter 2. Um, it's quite a neat story because Jesus' parents, uh, Mary his mother and Joseph, who is married to Mary, um, they, they take Jesus to fulfill the Jewish law and they take him to the temple. Uh, eight days after a Jewish male child was born, they took him to the temple to be circumcised. Luke records it. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, this is really neat for those of us that understand the gospel message that to obey the gospel, we repent of our sins and we're baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of our sins. And then God fills us with his Holy Spirit. Uh, the Jewish people, they understood that when you circumcise the child, he, that's the day he's given his name. And that's why Jesus' name was uh, given to him on the day that he was circumcised. And, and that's a parallel that when we're baptized in the name of Jesus, uh, Paul compares baptism to the New Testament spiritual version of circumcision. And, and we take on the name, not our own name, we take on Jesus' name when we're baptized. It's an incredible parallel. But, but there were two trips for these babies. The first trip to the temple was eight days for him to be circumcised. And then there was a rite of purification for the mother and when the days of her purification were finished, uh, according to the law of Moses, uh, they would come back to the temple in Jerusalem when Mary had fulfilled her uh, vow of purification and they would bring Jesus back with them and they would do something that's absolutely incredible. And the Bible says, uh, as it is written in the law of Moses, Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Every child that's born. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So here's what happens. Uh, not eight days later, but 40 days after Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph make this trip to the temple and they come back. And this time they're doing something that's very important. They have to redeem the firstborn. This happened in every Jewish family. They brought an offering to the temple. And as they came back, what they 
they were doing, uh, since God had redeemed Israel out of Egypt, they were redeeming the firstborn. He had saved the firstborn and they redeemed every firstborn by bringing an offering. This was a sign of the covenant as well. Mary and Joseph had to come back to the temple for this and they redeemed Jesus since he was Mary's firstborn. This is the ceremony that's described in Exodus chapter 12, or Exodus chapter 13, and here's what they did. They had to pay five shekels uh, for their firstborn son. Now, we all know that this is kind of a unique case because every other little baby boy that's born, they're redeeming a firstborn son, but they're paying five shekels this day to redeem the redeemer who would one day redeem them and all of us with his precious blood. Their sacrifice on this day is uh, two young turtle doves or two young pigeons, which indicates that Mary and Joseph were at the poverty level or below. Uh, a, A family that had some means, they would come and they would offer a lamb. But because uh, not every family had means, for poor families, they couldn't afford to have a lamb and give it up and sacrifice it. So poor families, poverty level families, were allowed to bring uh, two turtle doves or two pigeons. And that's what Mary and Joseph brought uh, as a sacrifice. They were too poor to bring a lamb for the sacrifice. But here's Mary, you gotta get this picture. Mary's holding the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They're way too poor to afford a physical lamb, but she's holding God's eternal lamb. And the temple on this day is the backdrop for Anna's story. And Joseph and Mary just happened to be there with baby Jesus as this all unfolds. And before we get to meet Anna, we actually encounter the story of a man named Simeon who also just happened to be there at the right time in the exact right place. And like Anna, Simeon holds no official position in the temple, but unlike many of the religious leaders of the day, he's actually expecting the Messiah. Most of them are just going through the motions of religion, but he's expecting the Messiah to come. And the Bible says, behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout. Here he is. He's waiting for the consolation, for the comforter of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by God's spirit, by the Holy Ghost. Uh, Simeon understood something, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So God spoke to him and said, Simeon, you're not gonna die before you see the Messiah. And so he's in the temple every single day of his life. He's looking, he's waiting, he's expecting the Messiah to come. He's not a priest, he's not the high priest, he's not on the Sanhedrin, he's not a religious leader, he's just a very ordinary guy, but he's expecting something extraordinary to happen. And the Bible says that, that Simeon actually ended up being there at the exact moment when Mary and Joseph finished these ceremonies, finished the purification rites, finished offering the turtle doves or the, the two pigeons, when they offered their little poverty level offering to God to redeem their firstborn son. They come walking out and they walk right into this man named Simeon. God allowed him to be in the right place at the right time. He came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, Simeon meets them, and he took Jesus up in his arms, and he blessed God, and he said, Lord, now you can let me depart in peace. You you can let me go to heaven according to your word. Because I've seen everything you promised me that I could see. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. This little baby, he gets it. He gets what very few people get. This little baby is a light to lighten the Gentiles. It is the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother, they literally stood there and they marveled at all the things that Simeon spoke about baby Jesus. I'm not gonna take time because we're not talking about Simeon tonight, but if you read the next few verses, you'll, you'll see that Simeon, he launches into prophetic statements. He begins to prophesy about this little baby. This is incredible. 
And, and so here's this, you got to get this scene. It's in the middle of the busy temple and you've got this man who's there by inspiration of God. God's told him, you be there. God's told him, I'm going to show you something when you go to the temple. And you've got this young couple we know them as Mary and Joseph. We revere them. We sing songs about silent night and away in a manger. and We sing all that. So Mary and Joseph to us are very, very special people. Mary's special because she was chosen by God to be that virgin who bore God's son. Joseph is special because he believed in Mary when, when common sense said, uh, she's been unfaithful to you. She's been immoral. But Joseph because God spoke to him as well. He was patient and loving toward Mary. And he raised Jesus as though Jesus was his own son. But Jesus was not the son of Joseph. Jesus was not the son of any human being. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh who came to earth born of a virgin. And so you've got this young couple that to us, they're incredible people. They're a model of godliness and faithfulness and dedication but on that day, it's just some poverty-stricken young couple. Their clothes are tattered and worn. Uh, they, they don't have any wealth. They don't have anything that would make them stand out. Nothing makes them stand out except they are carrying in their arms the Messiah of the Jews and the Savior of the world. And Simeon gets it by the Holy Ghost. He, he's, he's, he's cued in by the Spirit. And so here's these three people standing around this little baby and Simeon's lifting up his voice and he's prophesying and Mary and Joseph are there and they're all praying over this little baby, Jesus. It's quite a scene. Now it just so happens that in that very same temple, another person who came every single day to worship was there. She's a godly elderly widow. She's the second wise woman of the Christmas story. Her name's Anna. Now, it just so happened, we know there's no coincidences with God, but it looks like coincidence sometimes. It just so happens that Anna comes walking into the temple courtyard at the exact same moment that Simeon is standing there holding the Messiah in his arms and praying and prophesying. She just happens to walk in. Here's her story in the scriptures. Not very long, just three verses. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, she was the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age. And she had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. In other words, her husband died seven years into their marriage. And she was now a widow of about four score and four years. That's 84 years. So whatever age she got married at, let's say it was 15 because they married very young. Let's say it was 15. From 15 to 22, she was married to this husband that she loved. And then he died. We don't know what happened to him. We don't even know his name. But we know that now she's been a widow for 84 years so if she got married at 15 and she was uh, with her husband for seven years till 22, and now she's been a widow for 84 years, that makes her at least 106. She's feeble. She's elderly. She's weak and frail. But the Bible says she departed not from the temple but she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in at that very instant, God honored Anna's faith. God honored Adam, Anna's sacrifice and her faithfulness by letting her walk in at the exact moment that the Messiah is there in a little circle of three people and they're praying over him and Simeon is prophesying over him and Anna walks in. God let her be there at the exact right time. And, and so she comes in and at that instant, she gave thanks likewise unto the Lord. And she spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She went out from the temple on this day and she told everybody what she had seen. Now, the Bible simply says Anna was of a great age. Maybe we could adopt that. Uh, she's of a great age. That might help us some. How old is a great age? Well, it's about 106 if we've got the calculations right. You got to notice this lady, she'd had a lifetime of loneliness. She now had all the ailments of advanced old age. 
And she lived in an era where there was very little assistance for widows. Why do you think the Bible keeps saying all the time, I'll look after the widows and help the widows and care for the widows? It's because there was no bracket of assistance whatsoever for widows in that day. And so if their family or some friends didn't do it, nobody did it. And this is the amazing thing about Anna. She didn't grow bitter as she got older. In fact, she devoted her whole life to fastings and prayers night and day. And so much so that Luke says she departed not from the temple. Now, nobody was actually permitted to live in the temple, especially a woman in that era. Nobody could live in the temple. So when Luke says she departed not from the temple, he doesn't mean she lived there. He means that every time the doors were open, every time she had a chance to be in God's house, every time somebody was doing anything there, she was there. She was very old, but she was very active in the kingdom of God. And she was looking for the Messiah. She just was a fixture around the house of God. I gotta tell you, as a pastor, I love people like that. They're just kind of a fixture around the house of God. It's like, hmm, pulpit, stage, pews, there they are. They're just always there. That was, that was Anna. Now, after all these years, people coming to the temple would have recognized her. They would have talked to her. Uh, probably they talked to her about her favorite scriptures and her favorite subject, which was the coming of the Messiah. She had lived all these years looking for the coming of the Messiah. That's what she did. That was her thing. That was her deal. And so she's too poor to own any of the scrolls of sacred scripture. She doesn't have that much money. But during her long life, she had heard enough scripture quoted by the rabbis, that that she had memorized the scriptures, and she had committed much of the scrolls of the word of God to memory, and so they're written permanently on her heart. I I don't know too much about Anna. Uh, We're not told very much about her. Her whole contribution to scripture is summed up in about three short verses. But maybe one of her favorite passages of Scripture was one that the Jews liked to quote often. Uh, Steve Willoughby read it in Sunday night in the message that uh, we had the privilege of listening to. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Maybe this was one of Anna's favorites. It was one of the favorites of the Jewish people. Behold, I will send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly. Everybody say suddenly. He'll appear suddenly. He'll appear in his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Maybe that was one of her favorites. She'd heard it hundreds of times. The Jews held on to that with a tenacious grip because they wanted the Messiah to come and they wanted the Messiah to deliver their nation from everything that was wrong. I I don't know if she liked this scripture. I like it. And I think she has a very similar spirit to the writer of Psalm chapter 84. Verse one says, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, it even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I just want to be in the presence of God. I just long to be in the house of God. I just have an appetite for being among the people of God. Verse four says, blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. What are you saying, Mr. Psalmist? Here's what he's saying, that when you've got an appetite for the presence of God and you've got an appetite for the house of God, the trials of life don't mess you up like they mess up everybody else because no matter what happens, because you've got that connection to God and his people and his house and his presence, you just praise him no matter what happens. And verse 10 is the famous verse of Psalm 84. For a day in your courts, God, is better than a thousand anywhere else. You could live a thousand days. That's, that's around three years. You could live a thousand days anywhere else. And one day in the presence of God can bless you and accomplish more for you than a thousand days spent anywhere else. 
one day in your courts. It's better than a thousand. And so the psalmist said, I would rather be a doorkeeper. I'd rather have the lowest position in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I would rather have the lowest position here than the highest position out there. I, I'd rather just kind of serve everybody here than be the boss and have everybody serve me out there. That was the attitude of the psalmist. I just have a hunch that that was the attitude of Anna because every day she was in the temple. Every day she was there. And she was elderly. She's a hundred plus. She's weak and she's feeble and she's frail, but she's hungry for the presence of God. She's wanting to see the Messiah. And so as Anna enters the temple courtyard on this day, she sees her friend Simeon with a poor couple and with their baby and Simeon is loudly praising the Lord and prophesying. And because of her many years of faithfulness, God arranged for Anna to have perfect timing on that day. She came walking in just exactly at the right moment when the Messiah is there in his mother's arms and people are worshiping and praying and prophesying. So here's the scene. You've got some elderly people, Anna and Simeon, You've got this young couple who's just, they're paupers. They have no nice clothes. They have no possessions. They have no material substance at all. They have no money. They brought the, the cheapest, least expensive, poorest offering to God that was allowed under the law because they have nothing. And everybody else, busy, important, politically connected, Everybody else just walks by them. It is business as usual in the temple courtyard that day. People are busy. People have got to get to their responsibilities. People have got to do their religious services. People have got to do all kinds of things. And so priests and rabbis and men and women and children, they just kind of blitz by. But there's this eternal moment happening in the middle of the temple courtyard where an old man named Simeon and an old lady named Anna and a young couple that are anonymous in the first century, but they're famous today because they obeyed God and God used them. They're just all standing there. There's four of them now. Everybody's walking by. But these two senior saints and, and this young poverty-stricken couple, they're rejoicing that the Messiah has been born, bringing redemption to the world. Now here's the tragedy. Many sincere people went to the house of God that day. Many people with sincere intentions and sincere religious intentions went to the house of God and they walked right on by. They failed to meet the Messiah because while they had religion and while they had uh, good intentions, they weren't looking for him. They weren't looking for him to show up on an ordinary day. They weren't looking for him to show up in an ordinary situation, and so they missed him. Jesus did what he always does. He appeared suddenly when the world least expected him to show up. It's an amazing story. Her story's not very long, but Anna sets the bar pretty high. At 106 being in the house of God so faithfully, loving God's presence so much that she just can't stay away. And because of that faithfulness and because of that hunger and because she was that wise, God allowed her to be there on the moment when the Messiah made his appearance, his first appearance in public at the temple. It's quite a story. And Luke ends with this little footnote. He says that after this all happened, Mary and Joseph... This young couple that to us are famous, but to that century, they're anonymous. They're paupers. They're nothing. They're nobody. Everybody looks at them walking in the temple and walking out of the temple, and everybody thinks to themselves, they're not going to amount to much. Everybody was looking at Jesus that day in his mother's arms thinking, that poor kid, he's going to grow up in that pauper's home. Look at that young woman. She's too young to be a good mother. Look at that dad. He's young. He doesn't have a clue. They didn't know that Jesus was the son of God. And they bypassed the most important thing, the most important person, the most important moment of their whole era, of their whole lifetime, because they were busy. They were doing other things. Mary and Joseph, 
after this was finished and they finished talking with Simeon and with Anna, the prayer meeting ended, the prophesying ended, Mary and Joseph headed back to their little poverty level life in Nazareth. That is not exactly a place where you want to raise a child, not in that century, never. The Bible says, when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. See, Jesus grew up in a poor family, in an impoverished community. Nathaniel said to Philip in John chapter one, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Jesus grew up. And if you think he was some kind of little mini Superman, he wasn't. Jesus was just ordinary. Jesus was just average to look at. In fact, the Bible says, Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53, he said, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus wasn't even spectacularly attractive or handsome or there is no characteristic about his personality or about his physiology, about his appearance that would attract anybody. Jesus, who was God, came to this earth for the express purpose of being average, of being nobody, of being obscure, of being ignored, of growing up in a pauper's house. No beauty that we should desire him. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth that rat-infested little community. But that's the whole point of the Christmas story. Jesus was Emmanuel, literally God with us. John said in his first chapter of his brilliant gospel, the word was made flesh. Look at your hand. Look at yourself in the mirror. Live your life and think, Jesus became this. God created everything, became this. Because unless he became this, he couldn't save me. Unless he became this, he didn't have blood to shed to pay for sin. Unless he became this, he wouldn't understand what it was like to go through loneliness and heartache and hurt and disappointment and sickness and pain. He wouldn't know. So God became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus didn't come to a palace. That would have been a huge step down from the halls of heaven and the angels singing, but he didn't come to a palace. He, he didn't come to be known. He wasn't the, the, the leader or the mayor of his village. He was an obscure peasant, an ignored pauper. Nobody paid any attention to Jesus until he stepped out of the water of the Jordan River when John baptized him and he began his earthly ministry. Nobody paid any attention to Jesus for the first 30 years of his life. He came to be average. He came to be ordinary. He came to be less than you. So you'd know for sure that he wasn't gonna hurt you or harm you or hate you. That he was gonna love you he proved his love when he came to this earth and he became less than anybody in this room. Less stature, less status, less pedigree, less possessions, less position. He came that way so you'd know that he loved you. And then he went one step further and he died for us. That's a savior, folks. That's Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus came to experience what we experience he came to feel what we feel. And that's why Jesus came in obscurity, not in celebrity. We're in a culture that is obsessed with celebrity. Jesus had none of it. He came into obscurity. And that's how it is today. The Bible says in Luke 2 and verse 40, the child grew and he waxed strong in spirit and he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Jesus spends the next 30 years of his life known as Joseph's son. They don't know he's the son of God. 
He's Joseph's son. He doesn't do, regardless of the fables and the myths you've heard, Jesus does no miracles for the first 30 years of his life, even though maybe he could. I don't know. We're not told in the Bible. Maybe he reserved that part of himself until his baptism. I don't know. I do know that he didn't do any miracles the first 30 years of his life. He just lived in obscurity. He, to everybody else, was Joseph's son. And in fact, there were rumors about that little boy. Not only was he a pauper, not only was he obscure, not only was he looked down upon because of the social status of his family, everybody knew that he was an illegitimate child because they didn't know he was the son of God. They thought his mama had cheated on Joseph and they, they had all kinds of rumors going on around her. That little boy had less than a good chance at life. Obscurity, not celebrity. Poverty, not wealth. That was Jesus. And it's the very same today. Jesus doesn't push. He doesn't insist. He doesn't force. He doesn't coerce. Jesus simply invites. He only appears to people like Anna who are wise enough to seek for him with all of their heart. That's Jesus. Jesus grew up, you talk about Charlie Brown, Jesus was less than average. He was less than ordinary. It's amazing. Music, come on back. You've probably heard the statement like I've heard, Christmas is for children. Christmas is for children. You look at that first Christmas and you look at these elderly people worshiping God in the middle of a temple courtyard. You look at this young couple, you'll find out pretty quick that Christmas isn't just for children. Christmas is for everybody. Christmas is not some little fable like Santa Claus that we make up. Christmas is for everybody who's actually looking for the Savior. Christmas is not just for children. Christmas is for you. But you got to be wise like Anna and you got to look for him. You got to seek for him. Gloria Gaither, who's wrote, written so many incredible lyrics over the years, penned this little kind of obscure song. They dig it out once a year, maybe. She wrote these words He was just an ordinary baby. That's the way he planned it, maybe. Anything but common would have kept him apart from the children that he came to rescue, limited to some elite few, when he was the only child who asked to be born. And he came to us with eyes wide open, knowing how we're hurt and broken, choosing, choosing to partake of all our joy and pain. He was just an ordinary baby. But that's the way he planned it, maybe. So that we would come to him and not be afraid. He was ordinary with exception of miraculous conception. Both his birth and his death, he planned from the start. But between his entrance and his exit was a life that has affected everyone who's walked this earth to this day. With no airs of condescension, he became God's pure extension, giving you and me the chance to be remade. He was just an ordinary baby. That's the way he planned it, maybe. So that we would come to him and not be afraid. God is a terrifying thought. He's eternal. He's almighty. He's all powerful. And the wonderful message of Christmas is that God, who was all of that and more, he said, I got to show them how much I love them. In the Old Testament, it was all about barriers. The temple 
compound kept the Gentiles out and the temple building kept the ordinary Israelites out and the veil kept the ordinary priests out and only the high priest could go in behind the veil but only one day a year. So really that was a barrier even for him. And all of the Old Testament law said, you can never measure up. You can never measure up. You can bring a thousand sacrifices and you can go to a whole lot of ceremonies and you can try to keep the law, but if you break it in one point, you're guilty of all. So the whole Old Testament, it's just, you can never do it. You can never measure up. That's the message of the Old Testament. The first two thirds of your Bible, you can't do it. That's why the Ten Commandments are there. That's why the law of Moses is there. That's why there's all these sacrifices for sins of people because the entire message of the Old Testament is you can't do it. And you flip one page to the Gospel of Matthew and the writers of the four Gospels begin to say, we got a different message for you. The Old Testament says, you can't do it. And the New Testament says, he did it. That's the message of the New Testament. When nothing else could help, he did it. When I couldn't pay for my own sin, he did it. When I couldn't live a godly, holy life, he did it. When I couldn't do anything to turn myself around or save my family from the mess we were in, he did it. And that's still the message of the church at Christmas time in 2015. What you can't do, Jesus can do. What you can't fix, Jesus can fix. What you can't heal, Jesus can heal. Because he came to show you that he didn't want to be separated from you. He wanted to be Emmanuel, God with you. Oh my goodness, I feel the wonderful presence of God. We're going to close in just a second. We're going to sing but I want you to lift up your hands if you would. The presence of God is so beautiful and powerful in this room right now. He came to be with us. In fact, here's the news. He's with us right now at this moment in this sanctuary, in this service. Jesus is with us. Church, would you lift up your voice? I know it's Wednesday and I know we're having a little fun with this series and I got all that. But when the Holy Ghost moves in to an ordinary moment, let's be like Anna in the temple. When he shows up, let's stop everything and let's just honor him because Jesus is in this room right now. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Oh, how I love him. How I adore him. My breath, my sunshine, my all in all. The great creator. fullness that's beautiful dwelleth in him would you stand and let's sing together oh how 